So anytime I give a presentation and we start like digging deep, right? And that's what I'm going to ask you guys to do right here, right? We're going to get into some couple complex concepts, but we're going to do our best to like make them really simple and easy to understand because they are. But anytime I do a presentation like this, I'd love to start out with this quote uh, by the absolutely brilliant uh, Serge Grakovetsky. Physics is wonderful because you know that whatever you do, someone else will show you that you're wrong. And now that you know that everything I will tell you is wrong, there is no point for you to disagree with me, right? So, you know, I heard him start out his presentation like that one time, and, and I just, uh, I think it's such a brilliant way to start approaching some of these more uh, uh, difficult topics. Um, you know, the interesting thing about information, right, is that people are used to a standard education system where, you know, you get to a certain level and you get your bachelor's degree, right, which is a base level of knowledge and a relevant subject matter. And then you get your master's, right, which demonstrates mastery in a subject matter. And I think we often forget, right, to keep on learning. And I think people often also forget that literally the purpose of your doctorate, right, and your dissertation, any discipline, is to investigate a problem that hasn't been investigated before or solved before by using the scientific method. Literally, your doctorate is trying to prove things wrong that you learned in your master's class. And I think too often people learn information and then profess to know it all without continuing to like learn and ask for information. As I stated in the first presentation, you know, information is just everywhere. And you also have to realize that like, Experience and observation combined with insight often yield a new breakthrough into truth, which is what we are searching for in the nature of reality, right? Education, a lot of it is theoretical, right? We need to get into application. We need to get into hands-on. We gotta get a little experience at actually observing how these things affect people before we just profess to say like, oh yeah, what I learned in school or what I learned for that's everything. There's nothing more. There's a lot more. There is information everywhere. There is gold nuggets everywhere. You gotta dig, right? And you know, I, I'm a huge believer in the man upstairs. And ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And we have knocked a lot, and we feel like we've gotten a couple of answers, you know. And what we're gonna share is what I'm about to share in the next slide is like. The most important thing that we've ever learned about the human body and has changed my life as a coach, changed our ability to make players better, but it's gonna look like a lot of mumbo jumbo when you read it, okay? The human body is a fashionably driven biotensegrity model that craves efficiency and moves reciprocally, right? That one statement is, encompasses the most powerful information you've ever come across. Right now, that means nothing to you. But in one hour from now, hopefully it changes your perspective on all human movement, okay? Now, why is this important? Why is that statement important? Well, because it literally changed everything. <laughs> it changed the way I looked at everything, and it explains all of it, right? Things finally make sense, okay? But before we get in that deep, we got to start out simple. we got to start out with first principles, right? Which is a foundational proposition or assumption. It's the first basis from which a thing is known. And, and if we're going to do that, we, we really got to start by understanding biological systems. Human beings are biological systems. All of them crave efficiency. All of them crave efficiency. And the most powerful are the most efficient, okay? Now, let's think about what the word efficient even means. Capable of producing desired results with little or no waste as of time or materials. And being or involving the immediate agent in producing an effect. So this is just jumping, right? But we got LeBron, we got Michael, we got a kid in Africa in a high school high jump competition jumping over like an eight and a half foot, nine foot pole or something like that. How much flexion do you see in his leg when he takes off? A lot? Like, is he getting really close to the ground to be able to explode up? I mean, that's a pretty high jump, and it doesn't really look like much. When you look at James and you look at Jordan from their jump leg, you're going to see the same exact thing. I mean, that, that's really interesting, right? Because you almost think that they want to, like, do more, right? Get lower to the ground before they jump, but they don't, right? They're more efficient. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that the most powerful animals are the most efficient. This is a concept of all biological systems, right? Through the nature of our reality, through the history of man, right? And way before, energy minimization. This concept drives the design of anatomy, right? 
Crocodiles move slow. They chill. But then when they need to, they can move in very fast bursts of energy in every which way with every part of their body. Same thing with sharks. They don't go fast all the time. They don't look like they're trying. They make it look easy, right? And the reality is that's what the best in the world do. The best in the world make it look easy. Absolutely nasty, right? And when you really think about it, like all of those were home runs played at regular speed. And oh my god, does it look like they're out of control swinging as hard as they can, or are they making it look easier, right? And think about where the game's at. Think about what kids are being told. And then think about what you just watched. The best are the most efficient, they make it look easy, like they aren't even trying. trying. Now, this is our shot. Here we see some low back speeds and some high knees. So that ball's hit about 110. I think it was like 109.3, right? That's by one of our big leaders, okay? The second video here is by one of our minor league guys. So we get high school kids that come in with like 85 mile an hour bat speed. They're swinging as hard as they can. They're all over the place. You just watch the guy like barely move, super easy, right? Super controlled, super efficient, 73 mile an hour bat speed, but hitting a ball 108 and change, right? Hmm, that's interesting, right? Efficiency is king, guys. Based on the structure and design of the human body, we need to get to the strongest positions of leverage and move through them with the most economical use of energy possible. The most economical use of energy possible. Okay, now we've discussed a little bit about efficiency. Let's think about first principles of the human body, right? How do human beings move? What are first principles of the human body? So if we skip this back 300 years ago, all the way to Italy, to the Italian physiologist Giovanni Borelli. He was studying the human body and he wanted to make sense of the human machine. And he wanted to figure out, like, the mechanism behind functional anatomy. Like, how did people actually move, right? And using the mechanical knowledge of their time, this is the model that he came up with. And it kind of made sense, right? Like, it looked like people, you know, you can bend your elbows, right? You can bend your knees. You can bend at your waist. So they just looked at the human body like a series of fulcrums and levers, right? Just hinges. That's it. Just looking at it. It made sense. It made sense at the time, Okay. So now let's talk about what a, what a pinge or hinge joint is, okay? Like, they're looking at it as a one degree of freedom. One degree of freedom. If you have a hinge on a door, right, it can't go this way and this way. It can only go this way and this way, right? That's one degree of freedom, kinematic pair, used in mechanisms. They provide a single axis of rotation function, used in many places, such as door hinges, folding mechanisms, other uniaxial, so single axial rotation devices. Okay? Think about a scissor, right? How it works, how you apply force. Think about a wheelbarrow, right? And think about the arm. Now, in traditional biomechanics, right, this, right, and this model, this understanding, okay, is what was used to describe all of human locomotion. Okay? That the lower body does all the work, right? The legs go like this right, and move us forward, right, that was used, it's been used for the last 300 years, and it still gets taught in some universities, can you believe that? that, that's a fact, like, some of this information that I'm about to share is not only really powerful, like, it's not coming from, I didn't invent it, right, we're talking about, like, 40 years, 30 years, some of this has been around, but the education system is not built to filter information, that's why you gotta dig, right, so it was built to say that the lower body does all the work, okay, now, here's where our boy Serge Grakovetsky comes in. He wrote this book that changed my life, right? He wrote this book called The Spinal Engine. 
And this guy is a brilliant research professor. And one of the things that he said was that the fittest of a, the fittest of a species is often described as the one that makes the most economical use of its energy resources within its own ecological niche or ecosystem. What that basically means is like, he who does the least to create the most survives the longest. Think about the lion and the cheetah. Think about the crocodile and the, and the, and the shark, right? Same kind of deal, okay? Now, he's looking at that old model, and he's thinking to himself, like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, if the human body is a biological system, and all biological systems create efficiency, why would the upper body play no part in human locomotion? Why would the lower body just drag us around all day, right? And he literally discovered the fact that human beings are reciprocal movers, okay? Our first three milestone movements of human beings are rolling over, crawling, and walking. Each of them require us to have our arms work in opposite directions, right? Right arm goes forward, left, left arm goes back. And at the same time that our right arm goes forward, our left leg goes forward. It's the opposite leg. When my arms do this, my trunk is rotating this way. When my left leg goes forward, my pelvis is rotating the other way. It's literally constant counter-rotation. Everything we do as human beings is reciprocal movement. It's, this, it's a foundational principle. It's a structure of the basis of life, right? Now, this was proven even further with other ridiculously amazing research, but take a look at this. This gentleman has no legs. He's standing on the base of his ischium. He has no arms. He is walking. He is walking, right? Because he doesn't, have, he doesn't have extremities, which are literally extras, right? He doesn't have those, but he has what he needs to survive. He has his torso, he's got his head, and he can still walk and have locomotion even without the extremities. All of this happens right here, right? The rest of it needs to be slaves to everything that happens right here, okay? If you take somebody who's one of our pro guys, he's on what's called the cortex board. Right? Which is, uh, you know, it's not very balanced, right? You can spin around, go sideways, okay? When you try to throw a medicine ball on there, and I've done this with every player that's ever come into my shop since we figured this out and since we got that board, right? Because it's really effective in explaining it. In the last six years of doing that with guys, I've never seen anybody not go in opposite directions. Not one person, not uh, my five-year-olds, not our big leaguers, not any coaches, no one. Because that's how the human body is designed to work, right? We need to work in opposite directions reciprocally to be able to produce force. So a really easy way to think about this is think about like, you know, when we hit, right? We always talk about the core. And then just in movement training in general, we always talk about the importance of the core, the importance of the middle. Just think about it like you're trying to create tension in the middle, right? And that's created by moving opposite directions. If you're going to wring out a washcloth, you don't wring one direction and pull the other. You go in opposite directions to create tension in the middle. That's exactly how the body works, okay? And it works that way in everything. It doesn't matter if it's bowling. It doesn't matter if it is hockey, right? It doesn't matter if it's soccer, right? When he kicks with his left foot, his upper body is going across his left foot. Okay? It's everything. When a guy throws a punch or a kick, right leg goes forward, upper body counter-rotates into that kick. It literally exists in everything that we do in sports and in life. It is, again, a foundational principle, and it's no different than hitting. Right? Mike Trout, uh, Robin Yao, Stan, all of these guys move reciprocally, and they move more reciprocally than everyone else that isn't as good. Okay? Now, let's look at the data. Okay, so about five years ago, it was like four or five years ago, uh, after we first noticed this, so I was sitting around one night late and I was looking at video, and that's when I ultimately like saw it for the first time. And after that, like I started messing around with it. And I saw a professional, anytime you get results with like a, a kid that has a low training age, that's one thing, right? Like they, they get better with anything a lot of the time, right? But when it comes to a big leader, when it comes to a professional, like, big results are hard to come by. That's the 1%, okay? We started messing around with this kickback with one of our pro guys in the off-season. I had never seen him hit a ball over 104. And literally, inside of 20 minutes, he was in the teens, 113, 114. I was like, what is going on right now? Like, what is happening? So I called our biomechanist, and I said, listen, Emily, I said, we, we got to get together. We need to put together some research on this. We got to find out what's going on. 
And when we did the research, like when you had, we had somebody, uh, we had all of our players at all the different brackets, you know, from youth all the way to professional. We had them start in various stances, from being opened up to even to angled closed and adding the kickback. The results of the kickback in terms of max hit power, ground reaction force, both sides, exponentially destroyed everything else, like to, to an astronomical point, okay? Now, let's take a look at Mike Tyson for a second, okay? This is one of the guys that, like, if you think about it, has there ever been anyone that produced more force in a short window of time and space than Mike Tyson, right? And it is rotational, and he is trying to strike an object, and that object is moving, okay? Let's take a look at his body right here. When that punch goes to connect, when he throws that left right there, ooh, look at that lower half just grab in and work against it, right? Like, in hitting, we have to produce a lot of force in a small window of time and space rotationally to strike an object. It's a, it's a very similar thing uh, in hitting. Not only do we see that kickback, but with some players, we see this really uh, interesting, like, you know, the, the pelvis is actually recoiling and kind of rotating even more. So he's kicking back early. But take a look at his hips right here. Right through impact, right after impact. Whoop! Reverse. Slams on reverse, right? Uh, that, that's, that's a pretty amazing thing. And your best, like, guys, your guys who produce, I shouldn't say your best, but your guys who produce the most force in the smallest windows, that's what you're ultimately going to see from them. And that's going to show up in the data, too. So if you look at, like, KVEST or if you're using the biomechanic system, Right, but when you see this, see this gray line right here, right? That's our base level. So this is our pelvis, our trunk, our you know, this, this is the sequence right here, okay? Um, when you get right here, this is after ball strike, after impact, we see in correlation the hand speed, bat speed go up while this red line is going down. When that red line is going down, it's dropping below the zero marker because we're seeing counter rotation of the pelvis. And as soon as you see that happen, you see the bat speed go up. And you'll see that all the time. But that's the kind of graph you're looking for. That's not only an efficient sequence, but right here, you're going to see that from, from a lot of your uh, you know, uh, best athletes, right, I should say. Okay? So, going back to first principles of human movement. Well, all biological systems create efficiency. Human beings are biological. We create efficiency. Number two, all human beings move reciprocally. I can't stress that enough or the importance of it. Right? Can't stress that enough. Okay? And guess what? The model was wrong. The model was wrong. It was incomplete. It wasn't fully incorrect, but it was wrong, right? And guess what? It still gets taught in school today. That's what gets taught in school. That's what you're paying a lot of money for to go get an education as you're learning the human. That model is not only unproven and has been disproven, it's 300 years old, okay? So that's why we all have to keep continuing to dig for information, right? Uh, you know what they forgot? They forgot rotation. They literally didn't account for rotation. They were looking at human beings move just like walking. Look, the fastest sprinters in the world counter rotate the best. Running is not this linear thing. All the running coaches that are forcing people to do that are literally making people worse and slower, right? That's not what we want. We want the body working in opposite directions and the model literally forgot rotation, okay? Not about you, but I was mind blown. <laughs> like when we got onto this and we started to figure this out, this blew my mind. And it's just that it was a huge game changer. And I encourage you to really like dig in on that concept and that principle. So now we're going back to search. Okay, we're going to go back to search because he had a second thing that was a, uh, a huge part of this discovery that we're getting to. So this is from a presentation he gave in, I believe it was 2007. You can find it on YouTube. I posted the link here. Is the lumbar dorsal fascia necessary? Right? Now, in this presentation, he starts off by talking about the roots of confusion, saying a popular idea from the 40s was that back muscles do the lifting, and still believe today in spite of the evidence. Right? So, when you look at that, uh, when you think about traditional biomechanics, um, it, it's, they're using that and that other model we saw before, Right? And those levers and fulcrums and, and how you're on one side of a seesaw and you have the fulcrum in the middle. And if you want to move the force on the other side, you have to press down on this side. That's the model that they were using to actually calculate how much force a human being can, can lift or, or actually produce. 
And, you know, the, the interesting thing here is that when they were doing the math, and math is the universal language, right? When they were doing the math on it, and Grakovetsky was looking at it, he's like, wait a second, this math doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense, right? Like, I know what I'm doing. Like, I, I work at a university. I got this access to all these brilliant people also. Like, the math literally doesn't work. It, it, it would, the math says that uh, the human body would only be able to deadlift about 50 kilos. And that's ridiculous because human beings can deadlift over 200 kilos, right? So, like, doesn't make sense. Things aren't adding up. And in the next slide, it goes on to talk about uh, the calculated results and that the patient will explode when lifting uh, large loads. How embarrassing, right? And then he talks about rational thinking. And since subjects do not routinely explode when lifting heavy loads, one would expect the muscle theory, meaning the muscles are responsible for all the force we produce, to be re-examined, okay? So, fact chance, medicine is perhaps the only human activity in which an attractive idea will survive experimental annihilation. I propose that happens in baseball also, <laughs> okay? Now, the next question is, and this is the important one, if the, if the theory is wrong and the model is wrong, and it doesn't all come from the muscles, like, if the force doesn't come from there, where does it come from? Where is the force coming from, okay? For that, we have to go to our guy, Buckminster Fuller here. This is one of the most brilliant men that's ever walked on the face of the earth. If you haven't dug into his work, his research, his thoughts, highly encourage you to do so, okay? So as an inventor, a systems theorist, he's an architect, well, what his goal was, right, for this, he was trying to build more efficient structures, more efficient living structures. In fact, let's hear directly from, from Buckminster Fuller. Let's see what he has to say about it. I got into realizing that all of that structuring, all of engineering, is predicated on having marble blocks on marble blocks and stone to stone, mm -hmm. compression to compression. We didn't get into tension of steel until 1851. So nothing in roots touches anything else. And all of our building is in terms of something touching. So I said, can I discover the, how humanity can use its principles of holding things together? Because that's what Kepler discovered was these planets were holding together and with the sun and millions of miles apart. And they're holding together there's something invisible in tension. So I realized that when we made the wire wheel, we did connect the rim with the hub just in tension. It took a minimum of 12 spokes to do it. So I said, do I think, can, can I get into omni, instead of just being a plane like a wheel, can I get it omnidirectional? I like to, 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 to I mean, let's see, this is like a basketball, it just bounces. Oh, yeah. Now, it distributes all its loads. You're seeing a lot of sticks, and the sticks, no stick touches another. The sticks are like the bricks. Mm -hmm. They're held together simply by what you call it, Dacron thread, which we use for cleaning our teeth. But no thread is, is slack. Everything is all pulling. Uh, so when you when I drop it like that, it distributes the load through the whole thing. This is like a, it's like a basketball. Mm -hmm. It's exactly like a basketball. Put air into a basketball, pump it in, and it gets harder and harder. It gets a little hot. Now, one of the reasons I love this particular video is because even when he mentions that basketball thing, he it's like he says to himself, like, well, it's exactly like a basketball. Like, he had never even thought of that before, right? Um, and he talks about how, you know, when you put air in a basketball, it's going to get harder and harder. The other way you can make a basketball harder is by pressing on it. If you press on a basketball, it's going to resist you more and more as you continue to press. So these structures are clearly very different, right? As an architect, he's looking at those, and he's basically saying, like, okay, uh, you know, to build that structure, it's a lot of heavy material, it's not very efficient, it's super expensive, right? Uh, so I wonder if I could create buildings or create things that uh, use less materials, lighter materials, easier to construct, last longer, okay? Now, that's where he coined the term and came up with tensegrity. He literally invented the word. He made up the word. He combined tension and integrity, tensional integrity to tensegrity, okay? So when you think about these structures, right, they have isolated parts of compression, which are rods, right? And then they're inside this net, right? It's a net that surrounds the whole thing and connects and everything, right? It kind of almost envelops it, and that's with tension, okay? So it's the uniform of tension and compressed parts, okay? Now, these elements, like these structures, have some really unique and amazing properties, right? One, the structure only fails if the rods buckle or the cables yield. The next two are the important ones, right? Tensional pre-stress allows for the cables to be rigid in tension. 
It allows for them to start in a strong, independent position of tension, right, that can, to number three, has maximum mechanical stability. As stress on the structure increases, the stress disperses. And it, it gets stronger, it gets more stable, right? When you press on one of these objects, they resist you more, they disperse the stress through the whole load. It doesn't all go to one piece. If you take that building like the Leaning Tower of Pisa and you angle it like this too much, it's gonna snap in the middle because of the bending moment and shear force. That's never gonna happen with a system like this, okay? This system is built very differently to disperse all of that stress over the entire system, okay? Now, now we have to move to Dr. Stephen Levin, okay? So he was a brilliant orthopedic surgeon. Okay, and he's still around, you can find his work, you can read his work. Uh, so back in, I believe, it was the 70s or the 80s, right? Uh, this is a true story, by the way. He's literally walking around the museum. Okay, he's walking around the museum, and he sees a dinosaur's neck. Okay, and he starts thinking to himself, like, holy cow, the accepted model for the human body is completely wrong. The accepted model for human movement is completely wrong. Because if this body was built like we have learned biomechanically through our fulcrums and levers theory with compression of compression and brick stacked on top of brick, then the dinosaur would never be able to hold up the weight of its own neck. It would create a bending or shear moment in the middle and it would snap. It was at that moment that he literally realized what he had learned was wrong. Okay? Now, that's how he, then he discovered like Fuller's concept of tensegrity, and that they coined the term biotensegrity. Okay? Now at the time, this was theory. This wasn't proven fact. This was just a theory, albeit a better one than we had, and explained a lot of things in a really smart way. Look, human beings are omnidirectional. We can move in a lot of different ways. And all biological structures, right? We have uh, muscles, bones, fascia, ligaments, tendons, right? Uh, rigid and elastic cell membranes. They are made strong by the unison and combination of both tension and compressed parts. That's literally how, how we are built, right? So, now we move to uh, the, maybe uh, the goat of all time, okay? And this is the, the, one of the biggest pieces to this whole process here, okay? Dr. Donald Inger, right, uh, from Harvard University, okay? He runs the, uh, the Wies Institute, which is a biologically um, uh, inspired engineering at Harvard University. And this guy has more patents, publications, companies, and uh, has done more amazing things for this world than any of us all combined could hope to. He literally has organs working on chips, right, on little chips. But the concept of tensegrity is what gave him the ability to do that. And what you're about to find out about what he's proven has literally all this success, right, is, it stems off of one thing, okay? So when he was at Yale University doing his undergrad, okay, he was in a biology class and they were studying like, the structure and composition of, of cells. But they weren't learning a whole lot about how the cells actually like, moved around, right? They were, they were just looking at like, what was inside of the cells. And at the time, he also ended up taking an art class while he was there, same time. And guess what they were building? You guessed it, tensegrity models. And he was sitting around one day and he started to think to himself, man, you know, we keep looking at these slides under a microscope and they're all anchored right, to the slide. But I bet you, if that cell wasn't anchored to anything, I bet you it moves just like that. It's strong, and it's fluid and dynamic, right? And has this membrane covering the outside. I bet those are the same. A little different, but the same. Made the same way, okay? Well, he literally went on to prove that every single cell in the human body, right, is a biotensegrity model, right? Uh, his paper in the Sci in Cyan and Scientific American in 98 is one of the most unbelievable reads you will ever uh, uh, look at in your entire life. I think it should be mandatory reading for everybody, right? At every school, at the high school level, in the world. It is just a powerful and amazing piece of work. All of it is a result of, of proving that the human body is a biotensegrity system, right? Like, we're literally a Russian doll of biotensegrity. Everything from the smallest single cell to organs like the heart, to the body as a whole, the integrated system, okay? It's all one gigantic tensegrity model 
uh, with a whole bunch of small ones in it, all the way down to the smallest thing in our body, the smallest single cell. That's pretty amazing, right? And that's pretty powerful. And boy, does that, does that change everything, okay? You know, when we think about biotensegrity, the, the easiest way to think about it, just think about the, you know, the bones and the rods, but the rope, the rope, it's that fascial network, that fascial system that literally envelops everything, okay? Now, what is the fascia? Think about the fascia as this big, like, Spider-Man suit, right? Like, uh, you put plastic around you and suck all the air out, and it's attached and encompassing and, and touching everything. It not only surrounds us, but it connects to the organs, connects to the bones, connects to the muscles, right? It's a big Superman suit, right, uh, made out of rubber bands, okay? Now, think about the muscular system. This, this is important, and I think this is a really good way to, to think about it, right? Think about the muscular system, kind of like your Chevy Silverado 3500, right? What are those things built for? They're built to, like, heavy load, heavy lifting, right, and pulling it up a mountain, right? That's what the muscular system is really for. When we think about the ECM and the fascial system, think about it like a Ferrari, right? Or a Lamborghini, right? It can't pull heavy stuff up mountains, but boy, it gets off the line really quick and it stops on a dime. And it controls hairpin turns better than everything else. Literally, this fascial system and understanding this, if you've ever had a player that was like small or never lifted or it didn't hit the weights, or like we, we've happened to have been blessed with uh, a lot of young players that uh, have, have ended up putting out some amazing results. Like we had a, a couple of different eighth graders that were above 90 miles an hour and they weren't really big and physical. We have a bunch of ninth graders that have been up to 95 and 10th graders, 97 plus. Like we see college guys come in all the time that are 225, you know, lift weights, uh, can, can lift a house, right? Built well and they throw 82 in their arm hurts. <laughs> like, so, so why, right? Uh, Jake DeGrom last year had the hardest average fastball in the major leagues and it's consistently been going up. The guy who never touches the weight room, literally never goes to the weight room, right? He doesn't want to, doesn't feel good for him. That's not what he wants. He is using his ECM system. Both of those systems exist in everyone. Both of them work in harmony. But when we need to lift heavy stuff, the muscular system is kind of take over a little bit more of the load, but we need to move fast stop on a dime and make a hairpin turn, that, that's all the connective tissue, guys. Like, that, that's the fascial network, okay? Now, why is this important? Why is this stuff important? Well, it gives us the ability to, to start looking at the body totally differently. The, the old school of medicine looked at the human body and these, like, individual, invisible parts, uh, and they, they broke it down into this, you know, subanatomical perspective. Right? This gives us the ability to look at the human body as one gigantic integrated system, not the parts, the whole. Right? And remember what wisdom is. Right? It's the distilled essence of knowledge once you've forgotten all the little details. And you start understanding how the whole actually works. Okay? This is the most powerful statement. Going back to that statement earlier, this is an integrated system that moves reciprocally and it's surrounded by rubber bands. <laughs> like that right there changed everything for me, for us, for our results with players, both in health and high performance, getting results on the field, right? You can literally look at the whole body in this way and it explains so much. Not just about the greatest of all time, not just about little kids, uh, but about all of it. It gives us a more true and accurate understanding of of the, the sphere of player development, right? Now, another good way, right, there's another explanation that makes sense to a lot of people to look at it is that the trunk up here, right, not the extremities, the trunk, right? The trunk is like a can, okay? The pelvis is a boat. The legs are like ropes and the feet are like anchors. The only way you can fire a cannon from a canoe, my friends, is if you anchor it down from both sides with a whole lot of tension because you need the tension to give it stability, right? That way that what's up top can actually do its job. So I, I hope that makes sense for you. That one seems to get through to a lot of people and uh, it's a really effective way to also kind of kind of look at this thing. And we talk about anchors a lot, right? We talk about the back leg literally being an anchor and there's multiple ways to use it. 
like when you see differences in hitters, because there's there's things that are you know the same, right? And there's things that are different for, for everybody. Both systems are working here, right? George Springer is anchoring into the ground. He's moving reciprocally, right? He's grabbing it and gaining stability. Tatis Jr. is anchoring in the air, right? But the mechanisms are the same. What's going on internally is the same. They don't all have to look alike, but we need what's going on on the inside, right? To happen consistently with everybody, to be a high-level performer, and to maximize health in this thing, okay? Now, if we go back to our empirical observations from yesterday and look at them again, right? Let's see what we see. So, observation one, landing, pelvis and trunk are neutral with some degree of hinge, okay? Well, when we think about a forward move, right? Really, the objective is to move laterally and prevent rotation as long as possible. All those people land as close to square as you can get. Right? So you can grab the ground, you'd be in the strongest position to grab the ground right? when it's actually time to rotate. Okay? When it's time to rotate. So the objective of the forward move right, is just to move forward laterally. That's it. That's the whole thing. Is move forward sideways. And you know, when, when you look at these forward moves, they vary, and that's okay. One of the worst things about hitting is when you have like, players and you see them and you know exactly who they hit with. You know exactly who trains them, because they all do the same drills, they all look the same, they're all in the same positions. Well, do all these hitters have the same forward move? Do they all anchor the same way? Do they all know? Because there's, there's variability and individuality. But as long as we get to where we get to, when we need to get there, it doesn't matter. And that's how we still have to start looking at the forward move. The goal is to land as sideways without rotation as we possibly can. Land as neutral as we possibly can, so we can be in the strongest position. And we have to move as coaches, like cues are great. Cues can be amazing, but they can also be awful. Like think about the whole stay back cue, right? Stay back, stay back, stay back. Babe Ruth stood with his feet together with a gigantic forward move. Hank Aaron did the same thing. He had a monster forward move, right? So if you have somebody that has a propensity or tendency to really go forward, what do you think a cue might be for them that would work? I don't know, maybe stay back, right? Because of the duality of life, it puts them in the middle. But then when they start teaching people what was important to them when they hit, and they start telling little kids and high school players, stay back, stay back. Well, all those little kids, all those high school kids, now they're stuck. They're stuck. They never actually learned how to go forward. Go forward, stay back, doesn't matter. They're just cues. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. The goal is to get to the position and move well. Remember, it only matters if it affects the movement. If it's not doing what you need it to do, you got to go to something else. Okay? Now, Next, right, landing. When we mentioned hinge in that other presentation, that's posture, we call that posture, right? And different hitters, like we talked about, have various degrees of this hinge and posture position. You look at everybody from, you know, Ken Griffey up tall, you look at Freddie Freeman lower, Ricky Henderson, again, really, really low. Um, it doesn't matter the exact degree. Most guys gain about 10 to 15 degrees as they read the ball that's coming in to the ball they're gonna hit. Uh, and it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter what degree they're in as long as it's the right degree for them, right? Making everyone do the same thing, again, doesn't work. Getting a guy more hinge that doesn't need it could hurt him and it could make him worse. Giving a guy more hinge that does need it could make him explode and make him healthier, right? So it's about understanding each guy and understanding the body and how these things actually work uh, together. Now, the, the other big thing about this posture, right, what does it help create? Well, it helps us create space. So you see this window right here under Vladdy, and this was a home run in the home run derby, by the way, right? And if you look at that slide, you're going to see all the posture and hinge he gains as he gets into landing. Now, when you take a look at this space right here, our upper body, the cannon, has to rotate after we land through a window, right? Think about like a 3D window. And it has to strike this object out here. We need space and room for it to actually turn. When I'm up here, I can't really do that very effectively. My own body is getting in my way, right? That's why, like, Griffey only had, like, a little bit of hinge, but he still had room to do what he needed to do. You have to have space, right? And posture helps us create space, okay? It also helps us create direction. When you think about that hinge right there, think about if this is up tall and rotating, it's going this way, right? If I have posture and I'm rotating, whoop, I'm rotating forward with direction, 
right? My spine and my tornado is not going to my left into the other dugout. It's literally rotating to center field, right? I'm giving myself direction with my energy and my force, right? So, so having good posture also helps tremendously with creating direction, okay? So think about the swing, right, like an arc, but not a constant. It's not a circle. It's an unwinding arc that grows and gets larger. It's a spiral, right? So when we have good posture, we are able to take that unwinding spiral that's growing and get extension through the field of play, towards where the ball is coming from, okay? It's a really important thing to understand. Now, what else does it help with? Well, compression. When we get into the ground, right, we need to take the cannon and we have to drive it into the ground, into the lead leg. I'm going to tell you one of the biggest uh, fallacies in biomechanics is, and, and in baseball, just in people's understanding of it, force comes from the ground. Nonsense. Nonsense. The ground is nothing without us. We are everything without the ground. With the, the ground is just a stable object. We're independent. We're not an object like a chair. We decide to put force into the ground, and then we get force back out of the ground. The upper body actually creates deceleration in the lower body. So after we get into that landing, our upper body needs to compress our leg like a spring into the ground. That's what helps us get stable and stop in the first place. If I'm up here turning like that, that really doesn't happen, right? That can't happen the same way, okay? So posture also helps us with that, okay? Now, at landing, you're going to see varying angles of the lower half, kind of like we talked about. Right? And the stand specifically, what, when you look back, what changed his career, when he all of a sudden hit those 55 home runs, he started to close off more and more. Right? And we actually trained a guy, that uh, one of our big leaguers, who was former teammates with him, and we had him text him. No coach told it to him. He just tried it one day and just did it a little bit, and it felt good. It felt free, it was the way he, he described it. And he kept angling more and more closed. Right? And the more angled he got, the, the better his numbers were. Right? Uh, because it gave him space and gave him direction. But we're going to see a lot of different angles of hitter's lower half. Okay? Now, observation number two, an astronomically large percentage of the goat start close, step close, scissor. Now you understand why. Human beings are reciprocal movers and the greatest to play the game are the most efficient. They create the most force in the smallest amount of wind, the smallest window of time and space. Right? So as a result, they're going to move more like that. Okay? Observation three, how quickly the pelvis stops. Observation two leads to observation number three. When I'm angled or when my leg kicks back behind me and I'm working in opposite directions, rubber bands are pulling in the opposite direction, right? It's literally helping my hip stop and that shows up in the data also, right? Well, when you look at the best, their pelvis stops, this one right here, these sharp lines, their pelvic rotation stops between like 60 degrees and like 85 degrees, right? Like the, the bad hitters, the bad movers, the inefficient rotators, they carry that rotation way farther. They never create those deceleration moments. So number two leads to observation number three, okay? Now, rotational efficiency, good landing position, reciprocal movement, it leads us to rotational efficiency, which is so important here. That's, I mean, that's what it's all about. When our front foot lands, the ball is about 15 feet in front of us, right? Our objective, right, in that window is to get the barrel to get to the ball, right, in a really small window of time and space. Any moves that we make that aren't moving our barrel towards the ball are super disconnected. Right? We need our, everything that our body does to make the barrel move towards the ball. That's what rotational efficiency is. Think about it like cracking a whip. Think about rotation in general, just like cracking a whip to send a wave of energy. So if I'm going to crack a whip, right, and, and I want to crack somebody in the chest with that wet towel, okay, and I focus all of my attention and energy on going forward as fast as I can, Am I going to send the energy into the end of the whip and ultimately strike my target? No. No. I have to focus my attention on pulling back as fast as I can to crack the whip, to send the energy into the target. Right? That's how it works. Our brain literally maps backwards. When I think about pulling, I don't have to think about it in steps. I don't have to think to myself, I'm going to go forward, then I'm going to stop, then I'm going to pull it back. All I have to think about is pulling back and the other parts of it are implied. You can't do one without the other, 
right? That's what rotation is. If we want to crack the whip at the end of the towel, which is our bat or our arm, we have to create stopping moments in the pelvis and the trunk to send all the energy into the tip of that whip, right? And another way, look, take a look at big boy right here, right? Take a look at cracking somebody with a towel. Now, key in on, on big boy's belly right here. When he goes to deliver that strike right at the end, you're going to see his belly shake in the other direction. Right? It doesn't matter how athletic you are, right? If you're trying to produce force in small windows, this is how the human body is designed to do it. Okay? We're going to see it with everybody, right? You're going to see it with Mickey, you're going to see it with Trout, you're going to see it with JD, you're going to see it with all the best that have ever lived. Okay? Observation four, how quickly the trunk stops. This is a really powerful one. We didn't get onto this one until about a year and a half after we got onto the lower half deceleration stuff. And this, this changed a lot for us. Now, I love to study things outside of just baseball to help me understand baseball better. And martial arts is one of them. So there's this concept called kime. And in Japanese, the word kime means focus, but in martial arts, it's ha! It's that moment of the strike. That moment that you are creating tension everywhere in your body to deliver the full impact blow, getting all of that energy to transfer into the target. Think about Bruce Lee's one-inch punch. How can I create the most force in the smallest window of time and space, right? We're trying to do the same thing when we hit. we got to strike the object, guys. We have to transmit energy. This isn't just rotate and let the bat hit the ball. We are trying to strike a, a moving object. We're trying to strike it. Right? Yes, if we swing an axe into a tree trunk, it's going to stop us, okay? Just because we're hitting a baseball and it weighs five ounces doesn't mean we shouldn't hit it like it weighs 500 pounds. Right? We want to deliver the strike into the moving object. And that's what you're going to see from the best, and that's what you're going to see from people that swing axes into pieces of wood. That's how you transmit real force into the ball, okay? Red shoes and blue shoes, but question from the time it left the bat, but watch this! Never give in. Never give in. Never give in. player or kid that you work with that just hit absolute bombs and he never finished his swing. He cut off his swing. Oh man, that guy's got so much juice, but if you just finish his swing, you'd hit the ball so much farther, right? Guys, that Glen Allen Hill home run, you remember that? That's one of those epic home runs in baseball history. He hit that ball like way over 500 feet, like on top of the, I think it was the apartment building across the street at Wrigley Field. Absolute nuke, right? Think about Chase Utley. Right? He had notably amazing, ridiculous power for a 5'10", like, second baseman that really wasn't built, right? Everybody always said, oh, he's got the fastest hands I've ever seen, right? No, he just had the fastest, nastiest trunk D cell you've ever seen, which literally made his bat so fast with so much power in such a small window of time and space, right? We call those trunk D cells or, or sticks, right? Sticking the ball. Sticking that energy, sticking that moment of the strike, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing to think about that and actually understand what's happening, right? Now, a way that we like to think about this, and, and this helps with a lot of players, and this just makes sense of it to people. Uh, if you were going to throw a ball, and you had two walls to throw it against, and one was made out of brick and one was made out of foam, which one's going to bounce off farther? Brick, right? Stupid question, right? Even the asking five-year-old, they're going to say the same thing, okay? At impact, we want to turn our body into a brick wall. We want to be a stable object at that moment of impact. So that ball just absolutely 
explodes, right? And thinking about it like that, um, even has worked from a player development perspective. There's sometimes if you'll explain like a big rock concept to a player and all of a sudden things just click. It just makes sense. They move differently as a result of just understanding it differently. And you know, that makes me think of a quote from uh, one of my good buddies, Fred Corral, who's one of the most brilliant pitching minds in the world. Uh, you know, if you want the things you look at to change, you have to change the way you look at things, right? And that's just such a powerful statement, especially to, to kind of close out a presentation like this. So now you're thinking to yourself, Bleak, right? All this information is great and all, and now I know what needs to happen, but how do we train it? How do we actually get guys to do it? How do we take the chicken crap and turn it into chicken salad? And that's what we're going to get into in the next presentation.